Good evening, everyone. We're going to go to page 589. He's able. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's healed the broken hearted, and he set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. One more time. He's able, he's able, I know he's able, I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He healed the broken hearted, and he set the captive free. He made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. He's able, he's able, I know he's able. I know my Lord is able to carry me through. He's able. Mama's here tonight, so. The Lord, I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for what you want to do, what you're going to do. Um, I want to ask you to pray for Will's travel coming back and pray for the ministry tree and pray for, for the revival, Lord, and pray for my leg, Lord. Um, I want to thank you for my pastor coming back today, Lord, from his start as a former. Um, I want to give thank you for the message he's going to preach tonight, Lord. Um, I want to give you all the praise and all the glory, and I want to thank you for bringing my brother home yesterday, Lord. I want to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, grab your Bibles this evening. Uh, Colossians chapter number 4. I'm going to look through verses 1 through verse number 6. This is going to be a great study tonight uh, on the believer, his prayer, and his witness. I was doing this study this morning and uh, this afternoon, and this was very, very good. Uh, came up with some great outlines and some uh, great information for you tonight, a great study for you tonight. So again, uh, this, is, uh, this is for the believer, right? This is his prayer and his witness. So first of all, we're going to go ahead and look at tonight. Believers should pray. <laughs> go back. Go back, Timmy. All right. Believers, uh, believers should pray. Uh, so let's start out in verse number one. Uh, uh, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Now, let me touch on that, that verse there. Speak the mysteries of Christ. People have been hoodwinked by a lot of false teachers of false, false prophets, uh, uh, wolves in sheepskin, that there is a mystery that's yet to be unlocked. There is no mysteries of the Bible, folks. The Scripture says that there is no private interpretation of the Bible. Okay, There's no mysteries of Christ. You have to understand when you are reading the New Testament, at the time of the writing uh, that Paul was writing the letter to Colossia, there was no New Testament, right? So again, what did the believers have to study from, church? The Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, you find the mysteries of Christ. That the mystery uh, uh, of Christ was revealed and the coming of the Messiah. And so that's what Paul is referring to here. Nothing new, not a new revelation, not a code that's been hidden in the Bible for 2,000 years that God has allowed some, somebody off of YouTube to figure out. There's no mystery to unlock. I just want to uh, clarify that. Verse number 4 that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. 
Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know, uh, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We thank you for the reading of your word tonight. We pray you bless it in a mighty way, Lord. Bless our service tonight. Bless our folks. Thank you, Lord, for those who have come out tonight, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So first of all, tonight, believers should pray. And that's what we find in verses 1 through verse number 4. Uh, again, in verse number 2, the Bible says, Continue in prayer. Continue in prayer. So the first thing we need to do is we need to continue steadfastly in prayer. Be steadfast. What is it to be steadfast? Always moving, right? Again, there's that key word, continue. Continue in prayer. Be steadfast in prayer. The Bible says, seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face continually. How are we to continually seek the Lord? First of all, we're to ask, we're to seek, and we're to knock. That's what the Lord was teaching His disciples when we come to Matthew chapter number 7. And we look at uh, verses 7 through verse number 8. And and these are the verses that's not too far before when the Lord speaks uh, uh, on the on the context of, I never knew thee, depart from me. And he says these words here in Matthew 7, verse number 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That's a promise given, right? But how are we to ask, how are we to seek, and how are we to knock? we got to continually, continually be in prayer. That means we have to be steadfast. We don't just pray one time, have a two-second prayer, and think God's going to do it, right? We have to be continually uh, in prayer, always seeking, always asking, and always knocking. Ask, and you shall receive, the Bible says. As the Lord is teaching again in John 16, verse 23, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, He will give it you. Now be careful about that verse. What we have developed today uh, through spoiled brat Christian syndrome, I just made that up, by the way, but we think, well, well, we can live any way we want to live. We can do anything we want to do. We can say anything we want to say. We can paint our bodies any way we want to paint our bodies. We can pierce our bodies any way we want to pierce our bodies. And God's going to give us whatever we want as long as we say in Jesus' name. You know, we learned about that on Sunday morning. What it means to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost is giving God credit for what the devil does. is saying it's godly to be a homosexual. That's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. It's godly to paint your body. That's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. It's God that's making you pierce your body in different ways and do it different fashion. That's blaspheming the Holy Ghost. So don't say that I can live any way I want to live. I can say anything I want to say. I can act any way I want to act. Because as long as I say in Jesus' name, God's going to do it. He's not a puppet. Amen? And we've, we've abused that privilege uh, of asking, of seeking, and of knocking, and asking, and you shall receive. We call it the name it and claim it. Well, if we name it, we claim it, God's going to do it. Well, it may not be His will. Do you give your child everything they ask? Of course not. And so what are we to do? What does it mean to be continue steadfastly in prayer? That's asking, that's seeking, that's knocking, that's asking you shall receive, and then only that, but that's praying about everything. 
Praying about everything. The Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. What we do is we put God in a box. And we take Him out when we need Him. The Bible says we need to be prayer. How do we talk to God, by the way? By praying. You know, what, you know what, what the Lord is saying here when He says, again, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, He wants to have a conversation with you. He wants to hear from you. The Bible says that in five days, the Lord created the heavens and the earth, right? He created all the animals on it and on the fermentation of the earth. He created everything. And on the sixth day, He created man for His pleasure. And at the cool of the day, now we don't have a time frame. I'm not a gap theist. I don't believe there's a gap. I believe in six, seven literal days. Amen. But we don't know what the time period was or anything like that. Uh, he was having a relationship with, uh, with, with Adam before he, he created Eve. But every day, we do know for sure that in the cool of the day, every day, God walked with man in the cool of the day. And then came one day when man fell to his sin, and where was God? Crying out, right? Adam, Adam, where art thou? The one day he didn't have man to have a relationship with. He wants to have a relationship with us. And by that is through prayer. But the only way we can have a relationship with him through prayer is through Jesus Christ. Is through Jesus Christ. What a privilege and what an opportunity that we have access to the Father, that we have access to, the God, to God Almighty, that we have access to the Creator, the Creator of the heaven and the earth, the Creator of the universe through Jesus' name. But we don't do that. We don't do it. You know, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. You know, and, 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 and Roger will tell you this, he studied quite a bit of it. They had, to, they had to pray constantly all day, every day, didn't they? That was praying without ceasing. And what, they, what that meant was they had to have a conscious knowledge that you are in the presence of God all the time. That's what that means. I was thinking about, I, Peggy, I'm going to use your example. I seen you at Food Lion uh, Monday, right? And, 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 and I, we talked about some prayer requests, and I told her I was going to the doctor today, pray about that and everything. And I thought to myself, you know what? We as, we as people, we have to go grocery shopping, right? You know, we have other things to do besides being in prayer, right? And we do. We, get, we have to do those things. We've got a job to work. We've got to go buy groceries. We've got to, we, we've got to deal in business, go to the bank. Uh, we've got to go to the doctor. We have other things to do. And how can we continue to be in prayer when our mind is on other things, right? Paying bills, frustrations, getting upset. But what that means is when we are doing everything that we do, the Bible says whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We're going to get to that in a minute. We have to be uh, continually have a conscious reminder of the presence of God. Take Him to the grocery store. Amen. Take Him to the bank. Take Him to the doctor's office. I witnessed the doctor persons today. Amen. He asked me, he said, he said, I'm flipping. He goes, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. He looked at me. He thought, he had that look like, here we go. <laughs> he did. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then I talked to, uh, before I talked to the guy that worked with him, Jay. Jay's a Christian. He makes no, no apology for it. He, he, he tell you, I, I'm, yeah. He said, I go to, I think it's Elevate Church. He said, I'm faithful in my church, so forth, so on. But we have to have a constant reminder that we are in the presence of God, that we have to continue in prayer. Number two, second of all, we have to watch in prayer. 
So the second part of that verse, again in verse number 2, continue in prayer. Uh, in the second part of that verse, it says, And watch in the same. What do you mean in the same? We have to watch in prayer. What does it mean to watch? That we have to be looking, right? All right? To watch something, that we have to be paying attention, right? That we have to put action to our prayers. And that's what it means to watch and to pray. And the Lord said this again in Matthew 26, verse 40 and 41. And the Bible says, And he cometh unto his disciples, and findeth them asleep. Now this is when he went into the mount to pray, and of course he brought his his favorite disciples, I call them the ragtag, the, the rat pack there. And, you know, the ones that are in the back of the Bible, by the way. And, and, and here, here they had a problem with staying awake, didn't they? And he said unto Peter, he says, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? And he said these words here, Watch and pray. And ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why are we to watch in prayer? It's, the reason is, is so that our flesh doesn't take over. That we do not enter into temptation. Because the devil is right around the corner. Now look, the devil, by the way, the devil is not in the prayer answering business. The devil cannot steal your prayer. That is a false doctrine from hell. I heard it when I was growing up. Used to be a church right across the street from us. Went over there as a kid. You know, I didn't really, he just went over there as a kid, did the vacation Bible school. And I would hear many times that the devil can steal your prayers. He is not in the air, prayer answering business. But we're to watch because at any time the devil can intercept, not intercept your prayers, but he can get in there and he can tempt you by the flesh. And how did he tempt these disciples through the flesh? They were tired. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, at times we know we need to pray, but the devil always sends something our way to interrupt it, don't he? Don't he? How many times have we been out soul winning, right? Phone rings. Huh? I'm sitting in people's homes, and I'm thinking over the years, and, and, and listen, this is what I do. When I go into people's homes, and if I come to your home, and, I, and we're, here to, we're there to talk about business, I'm going to turn that TV off. And I've done that. I've walked up and I've turned people's TVs off. What, even my TV? What, that's an interruption. That's an interruption from the devil. And then as soon as we get into the plan of salvation, or we start to witness to the, to, 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 to the people, a baby cries. A kid runs in. All of a sudden, he's hurt. Dog starts barking and then the phone rings. That's how the devil interrupts. I'm going to tell you a story about this Saturday. And bless his little heart, he's the grandson of the pastor. So my little grandson, as you know, he, he's going potty. He's learning how to go potty. Right? And he's doing, he does really good, doesn't he? He, he doesn't ever say, i got to go out potty. No, he, he, he does really good about holding it and, you know. But Robert and I, we were talking to a fella, you know, we were talking about, you know, hey, you know, they were there knocking on his door and having a great conversation. Next thing I know, my grandson is using the bathroom on his porch, or trying to. And I quickly had to scoop him up and take him to the side of the house. That's an interruption, folks. You see, that's what the devil does to interrupt you. When you are supposed to be in prayer, the devil's always going to find a way to interrupt it. That's why we're to be watching. And not only to watch, but also we're to pray and not faint. See, he spake a parable unto them to this end. He said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. What does it mean to faint? To quit? To stop? Always continue in prayer. Number three is pray with thanksgiving. 
The last part of that verse is this. Watching the same with thanksgiving. You know, when we pray, we ought to thank God in our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. We thank God for the victory that He has given us. You know, we have victory. The Bible says, But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory. We ought to be thankful by glorifying God. Give God glory. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If you're saved, you've been bought with a price. And if you're saved and been bought with a price, you ought to glorify God for that. Amen. So we're to pray with thanksgiving. And when we pray, we, always, we should always give thanks. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.20 Always give thanks. Have you ever prayed and all it was was thank you Lord for this, thank you Lord for that? Has anybody ever prayed that away? When's the last time you did that? Amen. Today. Praise the Lord. And that's what God wants. Just to praise Him. Here's what we do. We, we treat God like Santa Claus. We have a list, don't we? Well, Lord, I'm going to have to pray for this and pray for that. And, and there's nothing wrong with it. God says, you come to me. I will in no wise cast thee out. He said, whatsoever you ask, He said, I'll do it. And God loves the little things. But are we always giving thanks? See, in everything we give thanks. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Always give thanks. And then number four in letter D is this. Pray for others. Pray for others. Look at, look at verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4 says, With all praying also. For us. That God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. For which I am also in bonds. That I may make manifest as I ought to speak. Paul is asking them to pray for him and his team. As they go on the as they're on a missionary journey, as they are witnessing for Christ, he said, Pray for us. What is it to pray for others? It's asking on behalf of others. The Bible says, and all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Not only that, but abide in Christ and His words, and His words so you can get your prayers answered on behalf of others. John 15, verse 7, If ye abide in Me and My words abide in you, ye shall ask that ye will, and it shall be done unto you. But here's the key thing. You have to abide in Christ. You have to abide in His Word. Get in His Word. Amen? Have a relationship with Christ. Again, we have this idea that we can put Him in a box and we can only show up for church maybe once a Sunday, once or twice a year, at best, right? And we put God in a box, but when tragedy happens, we think whatever we ask, God's going to do it. Well, you're not abiding in Him. You're not abiding in His Word. Not only that, but call upon the Lord on behalf of others. 
Jeremiah 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. One of those verses I had to learn in Bible college. We used to sing that verse. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And you know what the sad thing is today? Nobody wants to hear that. Show me things that I don't know. I know everything. We have a know-it-all know attitude, don't we? We live in a generation of ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Do you know you can find on the Internet the answer you're looking for? You can. You'll find an answer, but it'll be the answer you want. But it don't mean it's the right answer. Amen. Number two. Believers should walk wisely before those who are without Christ. Here's what I want to touch on tonight. Verse number four. Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. What does it mean for those that are without? Without means not saved. That refers to unbelievers of the world. Those who are without Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 12 through 13 that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus ye were sometimes were afar off or made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. You ought to thank God what He's done for you because at one time you were without. Let me touch on this here. We're to walk in wisdom towards them that are without Christ. Again, walk in wisdom. Do you know wisdom is granted whereas knowledge takes work? Wisdom is a gift. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, right? God gave Solomon wisdom, but to have understanding and to have knowledge, that takes work. In order for you to be knowledgeable about a particular field or a particular, like, like uh, Peggy and I were just talking about doctors, where, where are all the know-it-all doctors, right? You go to one doctor, fix-it-all type doctor, right? But we're, they're all specialists. What are they? They're specialists in their own field of medicine, right? They had to work to, to gain the knowledge and the understanding of that particular field. But wisdom is a gift given by God. Right? And the Bible says here that we are to walk in wisdom toward them that are without. What does that mean? Well, first of all, to walk wisely is to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, the Bible says this, that This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we are feeding the Spirit, the flesh weakens. If we're constantly filling our lives with the Spirit of God and listening to the Holy Spirit of God and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to guide us and to lead us in the direction that we need to go, the flesh then becomes weak. And then when we're amongst those that are without, amongst those that are not saved, we are to stay in the Spirit. We are to continue to walk in the Spirit, not act like them, not talk like them, not walk like them. 
You cannot act like the world to win the world. You've got to walk in the Spirit. That's what the Bible says. Walk in wisdom. Again, wisdom is a gift from God. Wisdom is given. And then to walk wisely is to walk worthy of the vocation wherein we are called. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. You know what's you know what's amazing about being a pastor? I see a lot of stuff. Amen. Not, not all bad. Not all bad. <laughs> but we need to walk worthy of the vocation wherein we are called. Do you expect a pastor to, to act like a pastor? Right? A Sunday school teacher, pastor expects you to act like a Sunday school teacher in church and out of church, right? That's the vocation wherein you are called. That's the way you're supposed to act, right? Okay, let's, let's, let's look on the secular level. The police officer, if you're a police officer, then we expect you to act like a police officer, right? You know, it, it doesn't look good when a police officer's committing most of the crime. Even though that happens, right? But it ain't supposed to. We go to the doctor, we expect the doctor to be professional, right? To be a doctor. You don't just go in and the doctor's wearing a pair of flip-flops and, and a, a Bermuda shorts. If the doctor come in wearing flip-flops and Bermuda shorts, what would you do? What would you say? What would you think? You would immediately say, I need a second opinion. But oh no, the church, we think that is wonderful. We think that is great. We need to walk worthy of our vocation. Right? Because again, we're to walk in wisdom towards them that are without. We're to be an example, right? Right? Again, we don't, we don't go in the doctor's office and, and then you say, then the doctor says, oh, I'm the one of them new age doctors. I'm one of those contemporary. Hey, if you come early in the morning, I'll have a shirt and tie on. But if you come later in the afternoon, I'm going to be wearing shorts and flip-flops. I'm contemporary. Would that fly? But yet we think we need to do that in the church. We think we need to, do, need to do that when it comes to the world, that we've got to act like the world, we've got to sound like the world, we've got to, to do the things that the world does to reach the world. Number three is to walk wisely, is to walk in love. Walk in love, the Bible says, as Christ also loved us. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Now, again, I'm saying this again and again that the world today has redefined that word love. We think it of as a, as a lustful thing. We think it of, well, if you don't do what I want you to do or think the way I want you to think or address me in my preferred pronoun, you don't love me. What you sound like is a spoiled brat. Huh? Don't you hear a child saying that? You don't love me. Huh? You see a child in the store? Maybe, maybe you've had a child like this. I have. I want this. No, we can't get this for you today. Why not? And then a little fit starts happening, right? You don't love me. That, that's your final words. You know, on death row, you have your final say, don't you? Well, that was your final words, right? As, as, uh, as them mamas from the south, I snatch him right on up. I snatch you ball in. That's right. <laughs> Whatever that meant. I mean, I guess. <laughs> hey, look, look. We had, we, when we were kids, we had oversized big ears, right? Because that's all Mama ever did. 
<laughs> About the only thing she could grab was those ears. But that's the way we are, aren't we? And that's the way we've raised our children today in this generation today. If you don't address them in the right way, they whine and they complain and they pout and they go all over social media so they can get everybody to digitally hug them. And saying, oh, I feel so sorry for you. You don't love me. No, that's not the love that the Bible is talking about here. The Bible is talking about the love that we have for your soul. The love that we have for you as a person. Look, I don't mean no harm to nobody. But I love you enough that I'll help you. Amen? And we're to walk wisely in love. Number four is to walk wisely is to walk circumspectly. We said that we said that today, didn't we? And now we're talking about. It. I said that's what the Bible talks about being circumspect. That means in a circuit circle, right? We all learned that in school. A circumference. That's a circle. That means we're to look to one side, in front, on both sides, and behind. To walk wisely is to walk circumspect. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise. Always be watching. We looked at that in prayer. Watch and pray. Uh, number five is to walk wisely, is to walk in the light. Bible says, if you walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as He's in the light, See, when we walk in darkness, you know what that means? That means we ain't in it. I went to a church some years ago with my dad. My mom and dad, they started going to church, and they were going to the, uh, what they call a non-denominational church. By the way, non-denomination is a denomination. You'll get that in a minute. It is a denomination. They say, oh, we're welcome and everyone. We do too. We're open to everybody. We are too. But I'll still preach to you. Amen? And so they were going to this one, and they said, hey, you need to come to church. I did. I got in a sh certain shirt and tie, suit and everything, had my Bible in my hand. I come down the stairs, and uh, my mom come in the, in the room where the bottom of the stairs. Uh, Robert, you'll see it in, in about a week. And uh, she looked at me, and she said, you're overdressed. Go change. We are a come-as-you-are church. And my dad looked at her, and he said, he is. Leave him alone. If that's the way he wants to go to church, let him go to church. If we, he said, if we are saying, come as you are, then he's coming as he is. She said, okay, I'm just saying, you're going to make people feel very uncomfortable. But that's the way I go to church. And I remember getting there and it was, hey, look, look, it was like Disney World. You walk in there, it had all the games, had the air hockey, had the foosball table, had some arcade games, had free chips, had free drinks, had free candy bar. And then you go over where the kids, uh, uh, the, the, the kids station, and it was like uh, McDonald's play place on steroids. Listen, they took an old service merchandise building, and I mean it, you know, the big tall ceiling, it had, it had all of, the, all of the, 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 the big balls and everything in there. And then you go in where the sanctuary is. It was all theater seatings and three screens. And I'm sitting out in the foyer playing with the nieces and nephews, and my dad says, come on, church started, come on, let's go, church started. And I walk in there, and it is pitch black dark and all you see is strobe lights strobing in the front the, 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 the stage lights smoke machines coming up through the seats and I mean they were rocking out like ACDC they, I mean they were rocking out and I stepped in there I said I looked at my dad I said God ain't in here Ah, come on, it is, this is church. I said, no, the Bible says that 
He is in the light. He's the light of the world. God ain't in this. This is darkness. So I said, I can't do it. And I left. And I went out and stood out in the van. Now, now by the way, angel, again, angel fears God like you wouldn't believe. As soon as she's seen that, she said, I'm out of here. She said, I'm not even getting near the building. I'm afraid God's going to strike it and a brick fall on me. You probably heard her say that. And I sat out in the van. I sat out in the van. I thought, well, I felt bad. My dad. Honor mom and dad, you know. So I went in there. And lights were turned on. And the preacher was preaching via somewhere. Satellite on the screen. And afterwards... And, and what I noticed, I was looking around, and people were eating popcorn. And they had a little cozy cup holders and everything, and they were drinking their drinks and everything. Getting up, getting down, getting up, going out. And afterwards, there was drinks and, and popcorn all over the floor. And my dad says, is it not a shame that they would do this to a church? I said, Dad, it's not a church. He said, yes, it is. I said, but not to them, it's not. See, it's not the light. You know when you're in the presence of God. And that's not the presence of God. And by the way, the name of the church was Live.tv. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's a thing out west more than it is here. But it, it, it folks... Folks, we're to walk wisely in the light. And then not only that, but walk, walking wisely is to walk as Christ walked. Walk as Jesus walked. 1 John 2, verse 6. He that saith he abideth him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. If you say you're in Christ, then you ought to walk like you're in Christ. If you say you're a Christian, you ought to act like you're a Christian. Right? Makes sense, don't it? You say you're a doctor, then you need to act like a doctor, right? What do we always expect from a doctor? It's, it's called bedside what? Bedside manners. And if they don't have bedside manners, what's the first thing we say? He ain't got bedside manners. Right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. You ought to act like a doctor. Listen, if you're going to be a policeman, you ought to be a police officer. If you're going to be a pastor, a preacher, you ought to be a pastor and a preacher. And then number three, and this is the last thing. I'll... In verse number six, it says, Let your speech always be always with, Christ, with grace. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. The Bible says again that we need to give an answer to every man. I'm going to get to that here in a minute. That our speech should be a gracious speech. Gracious, first of all, is to be sound. Sound speech. What does it mean to be sound speech? Speaking volumes, right? Not just loud, but wisdom. Speaking words of wisdom, right? Bible says, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy. Here Paul is telling Timothy here. 2 Timothy 1 verse 13. Hold fast the form of sound words. Words of understanding. Words of wisdom. See, gracious speech is sound speech. Speak words of wisdom. Titus 2 verse number 8. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. 
sound speech. What is sound speech is also speech that cannot be condemned. Right? That's speech of truth. Number two, gracious speech is not offensive. Now there again, we're living in a world that everybody gets offended. The words of Thomas Paine, he said this, if you're afraid to offend, you can't be trusted. One of our founding leaders of this country, who was a man that was a part of our uh, of our forming of this great country. He said again, if you're afraid to offend, you can't be trusted. That means you can't tell the truth. But gracious speech is not offensive. James 3 verse 2, For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and is able also to, to bridle the whole body. That's this right here. If we can bridle this tongue, then we can control the whole body, right? Amen. Listen, we get this tongue going. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That body starts moving, doesn't it? Huh? What you say about me? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so, right? And I mean, you, you start dancing all over the floor. Mm-hmm. You better watch yourself, huh? That's what we say. We get on the phone. Listen, do you, you ever notice that when you're on the phone, you cannot sit still? Is that right? We're walking around outside on the cell phone here and there. And you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> I guess so. But if we can learn to tame this tongue, we can control that body. How many of you remember the days of the... Uh, Landline cords, right, that, that will string all the way through the house. See, look, mom and dad were never rich enough to have a cordless phone. But they can go out and buy a phone that would, or a cord that would string across the house, right? And then mama used it to wrap around your neck. Maybe that was just my house, I don't know. Maybe that's why she got a long cord. She used to get several of his kids at one time. But how many remember talking on the phone and doodling? Right? Because our body has got to move with our speech. How many times do we move our hands as we talk? Huh? I'm up here preaching. I can't sit still. If we can learn to tame the, our tongue... If you can stop the mouth, you can control that body. Gracious speech, last of all, is always ready to give an answer for the reason of hope that lies within. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You ought to always be ready to give your testimony. To give an answer, to give a reason of that hope that's in you. And how you're supposed to give that answer, how you're supposed to deliver that reason is with meekness and fear. Does that mean fear towards the fellow man? 
No, that means fear towards God. That means tell the truth. Give your testimony and tell the truth. Give your testimony without holding some of it back because it might offend them or make them feel uncomfortable. Give your testimony. Tell them you got saved. Tell them you realize you were a sinner. Throw some scripture in there. For all have sinned. You know you're a sinner? Witness to them. Billy, Billy and, and Robert, Roger knocked on the door what Saturday. Again, I say this, that the man said he was a reverend, right? And Billy asked him if he was saved. He said that's... That he, he didn't like that, did he? Roger. Okay, Roger. That's a strange question, he said. Well, the Bible said you're to give a reason. You're to give an answer. For the reason of the hope that's in you. You're to do it with, you're to do it with meekness and fear. Not anger. None of your business. Knocked on one lady's door. I mean, this was a few years ago. About time to get back in that neighborhood, too, matter of fact. And I said, she gave him a great test. Oh, man, she said, I was raised in a Baptist church. and I thought, this is wonderful. Because in that neighborhood, nobody ever answered their door. And finally, I got somebody answered the door, and she was very nice. I said, well, that's great. I said, uh, let me ask you. I said, are you saved? She says, none of your business. Get off my porch. Get out of here, she said. And her husband come around the corner. He said, time for you to leave. Now, time to go, go. And I'm like, well, I, 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 I get, get. So I walked away. Again, gracious speech is always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that lies in you. Praise the Lord. Listen, praise the Lord. You got somebody knocking on your door that's given the gospel. I ain't talking about a Mormon. That ain't the gospel. I'm not talking about a Jehovah's false witness. That ain't, a go that ain't the gospel. I'm talking about someone who's going to take the written word of God and show you how to be saved. Praise God. Somebody's knocking on your door. Amen? You see, that's the way the believer. The Bible said the believer, his prayer and his witness. Amen?